The best epigenetic clock for predicting chronological age is the Horvath clock, and that's what we'll see here. On the y-axis, we've got DNA M age, otherwise known as DNA methylation age or epigenetic age for the Horvath test, plotted against chronological age on the x-axis from birth up to about 100 years old. And note that this is a multi-cell and tissue clock, and visually, we can see that there is a linear correlation between Horvath's epigenetic age with chronological age. Numerically, we can see that that correlation is very strong, with a correlation coefficient of 0.94. And note that a correlation coefficient of 1.0 is perfectly linear, so this is close to as good as it can get for the Horvath correlation with chronological age. But the Horvath clock may not be the best for evaluating the epigenetic rate of aging. And in contrast, Dunedin Pace is potentially the best epigenetic clock for predicting the epigenetic rate of aging. And I covered that in an earlier video. If you missed it, I'll put it in the right corner. So with these two clocks in mind, for epigenetic test number four in 2023, and note that this is July 5th data, this is the most recent data that I have for these two tests. I sent blood in August, but I'm still waiting on those results. What's my epigenetic age using the Horvath clock and epigenetic pace of aging using Dunedin Pace? So to answer that, I sent blood to True Diagnostic, and if you want to measure your own, discount link in the video's description. So let's start with the bad news, which was Dunedin Pace. And we can see that my Dunedin Pace for this test was 0.98. And what that means is, for every one year of chronological aging, one year of epigenetic aging. Now, the best Dunedin Pace would be 0.6. So I've clearly got room for improvement based on this test. But on the bright side, 2023's average Dunedin pace over four tests is not significantly different from 2022 data, which is what we'll see here. On the y-axis, we've got Dunedin pace values in 2022 on the left and for 2023 on the right. Over three tests in 2022, average Dunedin pace was 0.84, and thus far in 2023, it's 0.83. And that includes that most recent, this most recent test of 0.98. Now, rather than looking at averages between years, when using a two-sample t-test to evaluate if they are statistically different or not, we can see that the p-value is greater than 0 0.05 at 0 0.45, so 2023 data is not different from 2022, although I do have a few more tests left in 2023 to potentially make improvement. Now, what could have caused this result? If, not, if I'm not trying to learn from a quote-unquote bad result, I'm destined to repeat it again and more often. So. What could have caused this result? Now, I also sent blood for NAD analysis on July 5th, the same day as this test, and I sent that blood to Genfinity. Also, there's a discount link for uh, measuring your own NAD levels, so if you want to do that, uh, check out the video's description. NAD levels for the 7-5 test, July 5th, was 67.4 micromolar. This is my highest NAD level to date, and that's in comparison with my baseline NAD of 20 to 25 micromolar. So how did I achieve that NAD result? Well, for those who are familiar with the channel, I supplemented with 654 milligrams per day of nicotinic acid for nine consecutive days before this test, which then raises the question, is too much niacin bad for Dunedin Pace? Or more specifically, is Dunedin Pace significantly correlated with niacin intake? So I track diet every day as I use a food scale and also chronometer. So we can take a look at the average daily niacin intake that corresponds or that's correlated with Dunedin Pace over those seven tests. So on the y-axis, we've got Dunedin Pace plotted against the average daily niacin intake. And note that if there are 60 days in between tests, this is the 60-day average that corresponds to the latter test, the test number two. So for this plot, we can see a significant positive correlation. In other words, a relatively higher niacin intake is significantly correlated with Dunedin Pace. And I should mention, I looked, for, I looked at correlations for macros and micros, so, so there were about 40 comparisons. Only two were nominally significant, significant with a p-value less than 0.05, and niacin was one of them. Now, as a criticism, you, we can clearly see that there's one data point that's far away from the rest. So whether this is an outlier, whether this is a real effect, whether this is a random variation in the Dunedin Pace test, I don't know, but these are what the correlations show so far. It also raises the question, is NAD at 67 micromolar too high and potentially bad for Dunedin Pace? I only have four blood test measurements for NAD on the same day as epigenetic testing, so I, I'm not gonna run those correlations yet, but I will keep an eye on that going forward. 
And if there is a correlation between NAD levels and Dunedin pace, it opens the idea and the question of what's optimal? What's an optimal NAD? Clearly above 20 to 25 micromolar. It might not be 67 micromolar, maybe it's 40 micromolar. So using objective biomarkers outside of just NAD to determine what may be optimal for NAD levels. Now I mentioned there were two nutrients that were significantly correlated with Dunedin pace. Vitamin B6 was the other, and that's what we can see here. Average daily vitamin B6 intake, uh, their correlation, its correlation with Dunedin pace over those seven tests. And we can see that significant positive correlation. In other words, the higher my daily vitamin B6 intake has been, that's significantly correlated with an older Dunedin pace. But again, we can see that that one data point to the far right is driving most of uh, the correlation. Now, I can more directly test the correlation by removing that from the stack, which I have. Uh, not for test number five, but for test number six, I can take it out. And it was in the approach to try to reduce homocysteine, and I'll have an update on whether or not that worked uh, in an upcoming video. All right, moving forward, what's my Horvath epigenetic age? And as I mentioned earlier, Horvath's epigenetic test, also known as intrinsic, is the best for predicting chronological age. For the July 5th test, test number four in 2023, it was 52.49 years, which is two years older than my chronological of 50.4 years. And we can see I've got a red arrow there. This is clearly going in the wrong direction. So superficially, this is also bad news, but let's take a look at year over year changes for Horvath's test. And that's what we can see here. So on the y-axis, we've got intrinsic age, otherwise known as the Horvath test, with data for 2022 on the left and 2023 on the right. So over three tests in 2022, average Horvath age was 55 years. In 2023, over four tests, it's 52.8 years. And when using a two sample t-test, we can see that it's just outside of statistically significant for 2023 versus 2022 with a p-value of 0.06. In other words, there's a close to significant two-year reduction for Horvath epigenetic age in 2023 versus 2022, so potentially some progress. Now, it then raises the question, which factors are significantly correlated with Horvath's epigenetic age? And if I know that, I'm hopeful that I can reduce Horvath's epigenetic age, not just the 52, but maybe 50, 48, and getting it even lower than my chronological age. So the strongest correlation in my data is with body weight, and that's what we'll see here, with Horvath's epigenetic age data plotted on the y-axis against my average daily body weight on the x. And just like the dietary data, note this is, this is not my average body weight on the day of the test, but my average body weight in between, in between tests. So if there's 60 days in between tests, that 60 day average body weight corresponds to the latter blood test. And here we can see that significant positive correlation. In other words, as my body weight is higher, that's significantly correlated with an older Horvath epigenetic age. And conversely, a lower body weight is significantly correlated with a younger Horvath epigenetic age, which then opens up the question, what will Horvath's age look like as I'm able to or as I reduce body weight further towards 144 and potentially even lower. So we'll have to stay tuned for that in upcoming videos. All right, that's all for now. If you're interested in more about my attempts to biohack aging, check us out on Patreon. And before you go, we've got a whole, bu whole bunch of discount links and merch that you may be interested in, including discount links for epigenetic testing, NAD quantification, at-home metabolomics, oral microbiome composition, green tea, at-home blood testing with SciFox Health, which includes APOB, diet tracking with chronometer, or if you'd like to support the channel, you can do that with the website, buy me a coffee. We've also got merch, so if you're interested in wearing the Conquer Aging or Diet Trying brand, that link and all of the other links will be in the video's description. Thanks for watching. I hope that you enjoyed the video. Have a great day.